Steele and a couple of different articles from different perspectives. A lot of these are from um, Inside U.S. Trade, which is kind of an industry periodical that you have to subscribe to. So most of you wouldn't see it, but it's kind of my Bible. I have it, <laughs> uh, you know, bookmarked on my computer every day to find out what's going on, because a lot of this stuff is going on. If it isn't behind closed doors, which it usually is, it's, you know, just not covered by the regular media. So that's what you have to do to find out what's going on. Um, well, good afternoon. I was, what I offered to do was, and you can just zip to the next one. Um, okay, was to just give you a little update on what's happening with trade stuff right now. And it's a lot, so I'm not covering a lot of things that are on the, on the agenda. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk a little bit about what may be going on with the uh, um, new NAFTA or USMCA. Um, and then this Japan-US agreement that was agreed to um, recently. Um, and then kind of a bit about what's happening on all these tariffs that we keep hearing about the trade war. Um, with China and others. Um, this slide didn't come out. Oh, the next slide, Locke. Okay, uh, this is a slide from my last presentation in, in July. Um, and it just lists a whole bunch of issues that are part of what is um, part of the new NAFTA agreement, which were controversial in some way or another. Um, and in some, they were controversial in a way that this Trade Commission has been positive about, like reforms to the investor state dispute settlement, but other provisions are more controversial in other ways because they might weaken food safety provisions, for example, or affect um, digital privacy. The, the stuff that I have in yellow there is these are the only things that members of Congress are really trying to get changed. And, of the things listed here, I mean, I, I, I've highlighted, for example, country of origin labeling. I know that um, Congressman Golden has raised that issue, but I don't think it's necessarily part of the negotiations that are going on right now. They seem to be mostly limited to enforcement of labor standards um, and um, access to medicines issues. Again, there's a lot going on, um, but uh, most of it isn't in, in the public eye. You want to turn the, the page. Um, so, you know, the, this agreement was actually, this USMCA new NAFTA was actually signed um, like a year ago or so, but it hasn't been sent to Congress yet. And there's no implementing legislation yet. Basically, the administration through the U.S. Trade Office is negotiating with some members of Congress, specifically the House of Representatives, which uh, it has to pass through both the House and Senate. And um, the issues that they have focused on, those members of the, of the House um, of Representatives, has been um, primarily, as I said, labor and um, prescription drugs. So, this is just an uh, article. I'm just giving you a bunch of articles here, and we can go to the next one. Um, the, the issues with the labor provisions are that there's a lot of members of Congress that think that this agreement actually has some positive things in it in terms of requiring Mexican labor unions to be more like real unions and not unions that are corrupt or controlled by uh, the employers. Uh, and there's uh, provisions that um, relate to reforming labor laws, but the enforcement provisions are pretty much the same as what they were with earlier agreements, and past experience with earlier agreements are that when there's violations of these agreements around labor or environmental standards, uh, they often aren't really enforced. And specifically, there's an ability for the, the country that we would be complaining about, let's say, Mexico to actually block dispute settlement so that nothing ever happens. So this is the key issue, I think, along with access to, to affordable prescription drugs that uh, members of Congress are working on. The ne this slide here is just from a um, headline of an article. These are often the last couple of days. 
Um, where the head of the, the group of uh, House uh, Democrats that are negotiating on this says that they think that the U.S. Trade Representative is being very um, sincere in um, his negotiations with them, and they're being sincere, and everybody's being sincere, but they haven't come up with, um, uh, you know, finalized an agreement yet. If you turn to the next page, um, the different view is from the Senate, uh, Mitch McConnell is saying this is all just a big waste of time. Let's, you know, act on, on the new NAFTA and the USMCA. Uh, but as I pointed out, it hasn't actually been sent to Congress. They can't act on it until there's some legislation uh, to, to act on. So uh, next page. Um, and one of the issues I, I think related to this new NAFTA in, in the last presentation, I gave some information about the economic benefits or not of the agreement. I, I think the conclusion is fairly clear in most of these economic analysis that there's not a huge economic benefit to this new NAFTA. So why are so many people anxious to have it passed? One reason I believe, and I'm inserting my own kind of analysis of this, is that there's a lot of fear, particularly out in the big farm states, that uh, President Trump will unilaterally withdraw from the current NAFTA. And whatever you think about the current NAFTA, the fact remains that there's many manufacturing uh, entities and farms that have developed their whole way of supplying their, their everything under this current model for, you know, like 20 plus years. And so to completely rip it out right now without any transition w is a scary prospect for them and, and there's a lot of concern about it. So a lot of what's in this new NAFTA is the same as the old NAFTA. And so I think that there's a lot of pressure to do that. So I, I thought this was interesting though. This is just from a couple days ago. This is a bipartisan measure coming from the Senate where they basically want to say, to President Trump, you are not allowed to unilaterally exit from the current NAFTA. Uh, and it also has something to say about um, this 232 report, which has to do, it's a report that um, was commissioned by the President to look at autos and whether those are raise national security issues. And if they do, then uh, it would give him the go-ahead to impose uh, tariffs on autos coming from Japan and the European Union. That report has never been released, and so we don't know what it says. So this is an interesting issue, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later when I talk about what's going on with the whole tariff world. Um, but this is happening right now in, in the U.S. Senate. Um, and it just shows you there's bipartisan concerns about some of the things that are happening right now in, in this trade policy arena. And there's, you know, a, a lot of activity going on um, between the House and Senate and the U.S. Trade Representative's Office. Next slide. So this is just, I gave this to you July. It's still relevant. We're still at the exact same place we were in July which is we haven't yet gotten into the blue part of this timeline because the implementing legislation hasn't started, hasn't been implemented, hasn't been introduced yet. Um, but when it is, there's 90 days between the House and Senate to take uh, action on it, one way or the other. And to, to go to Representative Dillingham's question about what's the point of the commission, you know, what's the goal of it, part of it is you know, if this agreement gets to Congress and there's only 90 days to consider it, having a group like ours that's broadly representative and that's in touch with our members of Congress throughout, which we have been, is a very useful thing so that when decisions have to be made quickly under this fast track process, there's already been some, you know, consultation with people in the state of Maine about how it might affect um, our businesses or our citizens or our environmental and other laws. Um, so, next slide. Okay, so that's on new NAFTA. <laughs> and just feel free um, to interrupt <laughs> if you've got questions, because I know we've got a, a packed agenda, so I'm going kind of fast, just trying to give you an update. So, the other thing that's going on now, and it's not the only other thing, but it's the, the main big thing, 
is this um, Japan-U.S. trade agreement. And the, I do have these fact sheets that come from the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative that are right at the end of my presentation that you can take a look at that has more details on it. There, there's a certain amount, um, I don't know, maybe a little bit of smoke and mirrors going on here because this is an agreement that's been promoted as having been signed. It's not really signed. Um, the president and the president of um, Japan signed a statement <laughs> saying that they were going to sign it. However, uh, the text actually isn't final. And, um, you know, Robert Hamilton and I serve on the inter this IGPAC, Intergovernmental Policy Advisory Commission. We're supposed to write a report on this trade agreement and whether we think it's a good idea or not from the point of view of state and local government but we don't still have the final text to look at. There's been no economic study of it, which normally is done by the International Trade Commission. It's usually required. So we pretty much, you know, don't, we're having trouble figuring what to, uh, what to say, and it's not just me. There's representatives from a whole bunch of states that are looking at this saying, well, we, we don't really know. Um, so that's just, you know, something that's going on right now. The other thing about this agreement is that it, it normally a trade agreement like the US MCA, new NAFTA, that has like 30 different chapters in it. This one has one chapter, which is on agricultural and a few other tariffs. And then there's this separate chapter, which they're calling an executive agreement. And there's these two things which are not going to be sent to Congress for Congress to approve, which is a very unusual way of conducting a trade negotiation and a, and a trade agreement process. And this is what is being planned by um, this administration. The separate agreement is on digital issues. I'll talk to you about that a little bit, but I guess the concern I have, although this is a very pretty narrow agreement, so maybe on the, you know, it doesn't matter too much that Congress isn't, isn't going, going to be uh, looking at it, uh, but it, if this is the model for how trade agreements are done in the future, then it raises a lot of questions uh, about, um, you know, skipping skipping consultations with, with members of Congress. Um, so next page. You can just hit the advance button to lock if you like. Um, so as I said, there's two parts of this agreement. The first part is on agriculture and those fact sheets have much more detail on it. Um, the bottom line is that when um, the U.S. was part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. There were agreements made to lower tariffs on a whole bunch of agricultural products. And the U.S. got out of that deal, but Japan continued to be in it along with 10 other countries. And those 11 countries all are trading under these new rules that have no tariffs attached to many of these agricultural products. But the U.S. is outside of that agreement, and so the U.S farmers in particular are not getting the benefits of losing those tariffs. And so a lot of pressure here is to try to at least get a deal with Japan so that there can be more trade with Japan because right now the, the U.S. products are disadvantaged compared to these other uh, countries' products because the U.S. products have tariffs, the other countries don't, you know, you go for the cheaper thing. So that's what this is mostly about, is taking the provisions that were in the Trans-Pacific Partnership and putting them into this Japan agriculture uh, provision. I did note here that blueberries are one of the products that will, <laughs> that will be missing, will, will lose its tariffs, so maybe this will be good for Maine. I haven't you know, done any independent analysis of this, but I thought I would mention that. Um, and I think a lot of farmers in the Midwest that are getting really hammered, and I'm going to show you this in a minute, by the trade war are like, well, at least give us, you know, this thing. So there's a lot of push for that. Other organizations like the one I work for are a little more skeptical about it and say this is just another promotion of agribusiness and it isn't going to help the kinds of farms that we have in our state and, and you know, but that's what it is. Um, next page. 
The, this tariff deal also includes a few other things um, that tariffs will come off of, um, including uh, things imported from Japan, and uh, those include like machine tools, bicycles. They're, they're very narrow categories. I don't know if there's any implications for Maine. I know we have some tool and die uh, manufacturing that's very high quality, probably more expensive. Um, whether they would be affected by this because this is going to make Japanese uh, machine parts cheaper, I don't, you know, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the main goal from Japan's point of view is they don't want to get hit with automobile tariffs, and so they really wanted to cut a deal. And the th supposedly there's going to be a whole other part of this deal, stage two. It's really unclear to some of us whether that will ever happen. Um, or whether Japan, you know, it's really unclear whether this is just to get over the whole automobile tariff issue or if there's a real desire to have a comprehensive trade agreement with Japan. But the U.S. Trade Representative is saying there is that goal, and once it is negotiated, they'll fold all of these, these two pieces into the larger picture, and then they'll go to Congress. So that's what's going on. It's, it's really... It's kind of an unusual way to, to negotiate, at least on past practice. Okay, so that's the Japan deal. As I said, it's, we don't have final text. It isn't really signed, despite what you might see in the paper. <laughs> um, so you can move to the next page. Steph. Okay, so the tariff wars. This is, again, from my July uh, presentation, just to, to, to go back to the definitions that I provided then. What is a tariff? Who pays it? because um, we're all learning about this now. Um, just an interesting thing, you know, um, there was t been two sets of tariffs that the, the president has put on Chinese goods. The second set was in, uh, imposed in September. It's pretty much on everything. Um, there's been 29,000 American businesses, I don't know if any are from Maine, that have petitioned the federal government to be, uh, to have, uh, certain products excluded from this because probably they're making them the products in Japan or the parts are coming from Japan. So that's an ongoing um, process. Next page. This will be familiar to Senator Miramont. Uh, Maine's lobster exports to China plunge 84 percent due to the trade war. Uh, I know some of that lobster is going somewhere else, but there has been some, some pain here in Maine because um, many of these companies were actually looking to China for a couple of years to, to really expand um, their lobster. And just to be clear on this, we, we talked about retaliatory tariffs. That's what this is. This is China retaliating against the United States when the United States imposed tariffs on Chinese goods. And so Maine got caught in the crosshairs here. Now, I don't know why they picked Maine lobster, you know, whether there was political reasons around or because this is just something, you know, I, I don't know. But the result has been that Canada has benefited from this uh, at the expense of Maine. Okay, next. Yeah. For anybody else, too, if you have a question while it's timely with Sharon, jump in. The original tariffs with China, that was on intellectual property because there's no control by the government of it. In fact, encouragement of their own small businesses to steal it and then mm -hmm. within its embedded things that could lead back to security issues with the U.S. Is that how that started? Yeah, I mean, that, that I, I mean, I think there's several grounds for it, but that is certainly one of the express grounds. And I have a slide later on that shows what some of the goods are that, that things are on, but it's not necessarily linked to, just like Robert said, you know, the, the tariffs might be for about intellectual property, but they might be on something completely unrelated. And I think Sean has a, a question. Yes, yeah, Sean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, looking at the 84% decrease in main lobster exports to China, do we know, like, what percentage of what that 80, sorry, what percentage that is of overall Maine lobster sales, either within the state or to China or any other country? Yeah, someone knows. I mean, I don't no, know the answer know, to that. No, and we're selling, you know, because now Canada can 
still export without tariffs. We're selling our lobster to Canada, but we're not getting a premium price for it, which is part of why we'd expanded into these other markets to they develop ways to ship them more gently so they wouldn't die, so they could sell a premium product there instead of having to lose value by sending it off to be processed in uh, Canada because we didn't have processing. I mean, it's always one thing after another, but that's been the effect is to really undercut our prices as well as our markets. So, yeah. But I'm, I don't have numbers, I'm sorry. I will when we get back yeah. up to speed in January. So. Yeah. Yeah, there are those numbers, and I, and I mean, some, you know, some of these businesses have sold elsewhere, developed other markets, you know, but there is, what, what the senator was saying in terms of missing out on the premium, if it's going through Canada, it, you know, it's not the same as what you would get if you were shipping it directly as a premium main product, right? Um, so the next thing, this is just, this is where all the next slides come from. You can look it up. My printer decided to eat most of the pages, so <laughs> I'm having problems with my printer. Um, but it, it's kind of a useful thing that just came out from the Congressional Research Service, which has all kinds of really great um, papers and studies. Um, so this you can't see on the screen, but fortunately you have it in front of you if you want to look at it. And it's just a, looking at some of these, and there's this story to be told from this chart, which I found quite interesting. If you go to the second line, it's Canada and Mexico, you'll see that there were tariffs, and these are tariffs that are imposed, um, you know, by these um, countries. They, these are retaliatory tariffs imposed by these countries, China, Canada, Mexico, European Union, um, Turkey, and India. So you see that the ca Canadian um, tariffs, they are, you know, imposed in July 2018, but now they're, they've gone away. That's because the Canadians and the Mexicans signed this U.S. MCA, okay? So part of that was, okay, get rid of these tariffs, we'll get rid of our tariffs, everybody's happy, we're all part of the USMCA. But if you go up above that, that's China, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of tariffs that they apply to almost everything, and that the second round of it, the average is 24%. You know, it's like, that's a pretty big jump in, in price. And on some things, it could go up to 50% in the cost. So some of these are really significant. Um, and the European Union, same thing. They, they've been, they were, these tariffs that we imposed were on aluminum and steel under this national security provision. And so then they have imposed things, and they pick things like whiskey from going, going to Robert's point about maximum pain. They're, they're looking at products from like Mitch McConnell's state. You know, it, it, it's, it's not, it's political. Uh, you know, it is. Um, so that's what they've done. Okay, next page. This is a story, though. I mean, we have a lot of, not in Maine, but across the country, big commodity farms that sell things like soybeans and, um, you know, uh, uh, cotton and things like that. And this is just a chart that shows what's been going on, um, you know, over the last three years um, at, since the imposition of these tariffs on China, which is that a lot of these farm states and, and, and manufacturing as well haven't been, have been unable to sell, to export their products to China um, because China is getting their products somewhere else. Ne next slide. This is, an, this is some of the big products. And I think that's, you know, a lot of these mi Midwest farmers in particular are really being hammered by this. So that's, they're going to be very much in favor of this Japan deal and, and the USMCA, even though the USMCA really doesn't change anything in terms of tariffs for them, they're worried about, you know, everything being disrupted even more so. And, and so I think that's part of kind of what's going on right now in response to all this, um, really instability in some ways. Um, the next slide. I just thought this was interesting. This is all from this Congressional Research Service report. Uh, but this just shows China is getting their stuff from somewhere else. In this case, it's Russia. But they're also getting like a lot of agricultural products from Brazil that used to come from 
the U.S. Um, so, you know, you can just see how this has gone up um, as the U.S. products have gone down. The next slide. So one thing that's happened is that, that um, we're paying, paying a lot, lot of money to farmers, farmers in the Midwest to make up for the fact that they can't sell their products or they're getting like no, really, really low um, prices for a lot of them because there's a glut because they can't sell it. So that's right now it's $28 billion in a bailout that's gone in a couple, two different payments. But again, a lot of this is going to the really big agribusiness. And so, so a lot of the smaller operations, you know, really aren't benefiting in the same way. And if you talk to the farmers out there, which my organization does, that's, they really don't want this. They, they want to be able to grow their products and sell them, not get, you know, handouts from the government to try to make up for it, which it isn't doing. Which, okay. which is interesting yeah. because from what I've read, it's places like Cargill and ADM, Archer Daniel Midland, mm -hmm. that are getting all this money and they directly use it to undermine small farming at every turn and uh, put them out of business or bring them under their umbrella and then control them so that the small farmers make nothing and uh, they make more profits. So yeah. interesting. Yeah, I mean, events. that's that's a larger thing. And I think that that's the end of my presentation. But um, just really to give you an update of some of the currents <laughs> that are out there. But that's a larger conversation because I think that, you know, we have a, a farm policy as well as a trade policy that are very much oriented to the very largest uh, companies and that tends to promote consolidation of those companies and that kind of agriculture. And so, um, you know, the trade policy sort of reflects the way our farm policy as a whole. And so reforming the one is also probably necessary to, to look at both of those things. Um, if, if we want to have a, a trade policy that, you know, supports smaller kinds of sustainable agriculture, that's, you know, that's a larger conversation. So. Right, and that uh, leads into the other part that those consolidations and those policies the way they are now Somewhere up there, it mentioned that in one of the treaties that labeling is still not allowed, not allowed. You're not allowed to know right. where your food comes from. When it is allowed, some, like chicken, as we discussed last time, last uh, session, yeah. where they can grow it here, but then they ship it to China for processing, ship it back, and it's U.S. chicken. Right. And Things that, like that. I mean, just to, to circle back to the first presentation we had today, which was about the WTO decision. The, the reason that we don't have country of origin labeling for meats uh, in, in terms of um, beef and pork is because of the decision by the WTO that the labeling process we had, country of origin labeling, violated the WTO. It discriminated against other, the other countries, which in this case was Canada and Mexico. So the consequence of that, again, it didn't automatically repeal those laws, but Congress went and repealed them as a result. And so that is one of the issues that many people thought could have been addressed in this new NAFTA, because since the, the countries that objected to this labeling were Canada and Mexico, part of the deal could have been to just be okay with it and come up with a system for it that everybody could agree on, but it was never a subject of negotiation. I mean, it was never brought forward. Um, but that is, I mean, that was a WTO case, and that was the consequence that it repealed, we ended up repealing our, our laws as a result. Yep. So. Okay. A lot working against us. So I, I just want to mention in terms of the timetable, you know, we've, I know in July I thought that this, legislation on AFTA was going to be, you know, submitted right away. Um, it still hasn't been, but it, it still could be um, sometime soon. So, you know, that might be something that the Commission wants to talk about in terms of with our members of Congress or whatever um, going forward, but we're still waiting to see it. <laughs>